So welcome everyone to the discussion um, on media encounters, cultural confrontations, kulturpolitik agents and networks of the Goethe Institute. I know the name is a bit of a load and that's everything that we're going to unpack today. And uh, my name is Miyu, I am at the Documenta Institute and I'm thrilled to be joined by Merv Espina and Regina Virbul today. Murph is currently a fellow at the Documenta Institute. Um, you're also an artist and researcher, and we know each other when you when you were talking about media art history in in the Philippines, in Guangzhou. Um, but just as well, you work with uh, actually you can make radio yourself, right? That's the work that you did for Yokohama Triennial. It was on, okay, good, not radio. Um, so I just wanna say that Murph is is really an overrun cultural producer and also organizer of um, the Green Papaya, or was until recently a, a, a organizer of the Green Papaya space in Manila. Um, and you really work across, I think, many different cultural contexts. Um, I know you've worked on archives in Southeast Asia, but in today's context, you're, you're actually going to talk about, in a way, archives that connects that region to um, Germany. So, and Regina um, is also an all-around cultural producer. <laughs> You've had uh, many, many titles. Uh, you were a journalist, uh, as I understand. And then um, in the 90s, uh, you worked as the uh, director for the media program of, of the Goethe Institute. After that, you were um, the, chairs, the chairwoman of uh, Anavi Kunststiftung. And then and I think you're on the Vorstand, how do you say Vorstand? Uh, you're on the board of uh, Kuratorium of the Ludwig Stiftung, among other, many other um, titles. So the reason that we come here today is because of Merv's very um, inquisitive um, journey into the history of the Goethe Institute, um, where uh, we started learning about this whole network um, and really decentralized network um, of the Goethe Institute, um, where different um, offices in different regions, primarily in the non-West countries, in the Global South countries, already in the 80s and 90s, uh, were hosting uh, film and media workshops that actually trained and enabled the encounter um, uh, I, I of uh, media, art, and film of many of the local artists. So that's something that you're going to um, tell us a little bit more about. And uh, with that, we have uh, Regina here because you actually experienced that time and you experienced the institution um, uh, uh, both within but also with a certain self-reflection, right? So. Uh, we have a lot of keywords such as um, mediation, pedagogy, but also gatekeeping and orientalization. So that's um, that. All of that might happen in the culture encounters, um, but I think our interest is also in um, the sort of cultural policy um, aspect of that. Be and is, is, uh, the German word Kulturpolitik actually can be translated both as cultural policy for sort of domestic context, but also in terms of cultural diplomacy on the international stage, right? So, so really looking at the role of the institution uh, in uh, 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 connecting this uh, 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 cultural policy in Germany, but also cultural diplomacy internationally in a context where Germany, you know, in the post-war years, um, we're not really supposed to, was not really supposed to, 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 to assert its cultural <laughs> identity, right? So all of that is interesting for us to unpack. So I guess we'll start by having Murph giving a short presentation on your research findings. Thank you for the nice introduction, Miu, and uh, it's an honor to be in the same panel as <laughs> Regina whose name I've been finding in the archives during this research. It's nice to have a 
person behind the name. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I'd, I'd like to give a, a, a brief overview of the project research. Actually, I've, st I've started this um, research much, much earlier before the pandemic. Um, starting from a Philippine perspective, um, in uh, 2012, uh, a, a friend and colleague of mine, uh, Tilman Baumgartel, uh, produced this book called Kino Cine, which looked at primarily the uh, German-Filipino film relations. And m m of course, all of those were brokered by the Goethe Institute and to almost to a lesser extent the German embassy, but it was really the Goethe Institute primarily through the time of uh, this director, Uwe Schmelter, who came in around 85, 86, that the, the particularly the experimental film production in the Philippines really gained a certain momentum. And um, so I looked at it from that perspective and through that publication, but then I started to realize that a lot of these same people went to different parts of the world doing these similar workshops elsewhere. Um, so I kind of, over the years, I've been following their ghosts, their trails to, uh, to different cities, not just across Asia, but across the world, well, the third world in, in particular, uh, from that particular geopolitical point of view. Uh, and um, I'd like to maybe focus on one of them. His, his name is uh, Christoph Janetsko. Um, and maybe, so, oh. so these are just some slides that I found. Um, so a lot of these materials don't exist in the Philippines anymore. Um, so just getting a list of the materials and what was produced was very challenging. So I've been going through a lot of these uh, materials through uh, the help of other uh, archives, other institutions, um, and most especially uh, through some of the, the artists and filmmakers who taught these workshops in the first place. In 2017, we were able to do a pro program with the Hakabe, uh, which also featured one artist called Roxley. And uh, through that, we managed to get access to the uh, Arsenal archives, and we saw some of the films that we thought were missing. <laughs> it, they, ju they just kept it, and it seems that, you know, judging on the distribution records, no one has touched them since the 80s. So this is like uh, just some examples. Uh, next, please. And uh, they also kept a lot of the, the documentation materials, uh, a lot of the... Um, communications in English and German uh, with Ulrich Gregor, uh, co-founder of the Arsenal, and different uh, institutions and artists that were responsible in uh, making this, like, th th uh, this Philippine focus in 1989 um, uh, possible. Um, unfortunately, these are missing. So I've th these were found in 2017. They were neatly in a folder. Uh, I said, like, when I have better, uh, more time and resources, let's get these scanned, like all these materials. So I'm back. I, I, I said, like, let's 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 scan them, <laughs> and then we tried to look for them with uh, with one of the board members, and over two days we can't find it. Anyway, <laughs> this is <laughs> what <laughs> what remains. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, so. The German experience was really quite interesting for a lot of the artists. It was also the first time they were exposed to, uh, for a lot of them, the an international stage, an international network, and uh, you could, uh, they, they, one of the uh, one of them, Roxley, would make like little comic strips about his journeys. Um, this is one of them, like his first time in Berlin, for example. Uh, next. And uh, this is just a short clip, um, like some, some archival materials that was shared to me by Christoph Janetsko. So in the next few slides, I'll just focus on just this one figure and where he went after. So he, 
uh, first came to the Philippines in 1988, and he did two consecutive workshops there. Um, and I think that served as a kind of a blueprint to, to the other workshops that he did elsewhere. And uh, the next one after that was in, uh, next slide please, and in Glasgow in 1990. And um, the next one in uh, Rio de Janeiro in 1991. And I would find out uh, just a few, uh, just last month, no, that actually the inspiration for the 1991 workshop was actually um, when the artists and filmmakers uh, saw the works not in Berlin or anywhere in Germany, but in Toronto. And there was an experimental film congress in Toronto in 1989 that actually Christoph was also responsible in uh, uh, co-initiating. And the filmmakers wanted, like, let's do this also in Rio. Through and uh, they, they convinced the Goethe Institute to enable it. And I think from there they produced something like 11 or 14 films, quite a number. Uh, next. And then, of course, in uh, Bangkok in 1992, um, from this workshop, some important figures that will become quite important names in contemporary art and film, like Pimpakatawira and uh, Manit Sriwanichpum. Uh, next, please. And uh, Hong Kong in 1992. Um, this is Common Mo. Um, it was a bit different format. It was a more direct one-on-one -on -one with Komen Mo, where he was fulfilling a more uh, ex like producer role, uh, and Komen and they were working with the students to produce one film under the authorship of Komen Mo. Uh, next, please. And then 1992 in Seoul. So 1992 and Seoul and. Uh, Bangkok and Hong Kong were almost simultaneously happening that same year, so he was actually jet setting between the different locations. So when one was like in production or one was like they were developing film, he would go to another place. So a lot of uh, no, no. <laughs> air mileage. And uh, uh, next, please. Um, hi, hi. <laughs> Some friends from Bangkok, <laughs> <laughs> and um, and so when I started to dig in more into this research, I I I, I found out about uh, nine this this focus at the Oberhausen Film Festival in 1993, and it was really really interesting because it was, in my knowledge, and I and there I haven't encountered anything else similar to it since. But this was the major survey of all the Goethe Institute productions between uh, 1984 to 1993. Um, I haven't seen anything like that since. And it featured not just works from Asia, but Africa and Latin America. And uh, next, please. Uh, yeah, just an import, like a list. Um, so, it became a kind of checklist for me to lo go through these materials. Like, uh, and when I was able to go to the Oberhausen in, in late April and May to go through their archives, it was really interesting, maybe much more interesting to me, the artists that made it to the short list and not to the final uh, catalog and screening list because they also featured artists like uh, the Rox Media Collective. And it seems that the first work that they made was actually in a Goethe Institute workshop. And I, I talked to them about it, like, ah, and actually that's true, no? In 1991, there was a Johann Feint workshop in uh, New Delhi, and that's the first film work that they did together. And next. And uh, it, this, this um, festival, the theme was Confrontation of Cultures. Um, this was uh, titled that, and it was designed to actually address this wave of racism that uh, Germany was experiencing at that time period. Um, there was a few racist attacks in the years prior, some murders, 
And so the Oberhausen wanted to address this and like uh, to feature the uh, more works from the from what is what we now call the global south. Um, and so there was a lot of focus on uh, black cinema. Uh, they invited artists and curators like Hoko Fusco to, to make programs and to talk. And there was a lot of like healthy debate and maybe a lot of unresolved issues. Hoko Fusco uh, doesn't want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> um, and it for, for the Festival director Angela Hart. It was also a time, like a good opportunity for her to also confront, like uh, this, the Goethe Institute workshop model, what it actually does, did, and um, and maybe like you know, <laughs> poke 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 at the some of the directors and the artists about their impact and influence, and is this actually helping? Is this not? Is this a new kind of cultural colonialism? These are some of the. Uh, issues raised, and this art, this uh, art critic called Pankaj Batalia, like was was really quite fiery, and he, um, he was not, uh, he was just there, really asking questions in every panel during the conference. Um, next slide, that's him. Uh, and so, next slide, please. So I've been here since April. I've been going through the different archives around Germany. Uh, personal and institutional. Um, so, it's, uh, and along the way, I've been and collecting a lot of uh, materials. So, I notified the Documenta Archive about this research, and they said, like, we can actually help transfer some of the materials that you have, just the at least the video materials, because they don't have a capacity for 16, 35, or Super 8, not no analog film. But at least we could. Uh, finally get access to some of these film works. So nano, because of, I guess, how Go Goethe Institute functions, not a lot of people actually know what these the contents are. But fortunately, some of them have names. Um, and uh, for example, Tanda Api, I figured, uh, found out that Rotraut Pape uh, was responsible for this workshop. She was flown in in 1997. This was the first Indonesian video art exhibition. Um, and Rotrat Pape um, came back to the Gut, uh, uh, through the invitation of the Goethe Institute uh, in Jakarta several times from between 1997 until 2007. Uh, and she was really quite invested into uh, Indonesia. Um, uh, uh, not just her, but also her collective called uh, Club Automatique. And they were in directly working with uh, media artists, the first generation of uh, bio artists, media artists in, in Indonesia, particularly the group called the uh, House of Natural Fiber. Um, so, and uh, next, and then, uh, because this is, th these tapes are, the collection of a uh, uh, gut institute director who was active in in Jakarta from 1998 to 2003, uh, Detlef Gerike. I think he was also in uh, the main office of before this, of course, and um, he, of course, was there when Ruang Rupa was founded. And uh, these are, these are tapes. Some of the, some of these tapes, Ruang Rupa doesn't have access to anymore. So we're also digitizing these. It's nice that <laughs> there's a direct relationship to, to this archival research to the current artistic directors. But, uh, and that, that, that's it. Uh, that's what I've been doing so far. So these are being digitized as we speak. I think they, as of today, they finished with the VHS and now they're working on the Umatic. They'll be done around uh, Wednesday next week, so, uh, so I can we can finally view them, and maybe at some point in the future we'll do another screening because I've been able to track down some of the artists, and they don't ha m almost all of them don't have copies of these works. Can I have you in front? Uh, did you ever try to inform Goethe Institute about your research? They are aware. I um. mean, uh, it's just that uh, so I'm working primarily with the film department. Mm -hmm. um, 
Mark An Mark Andre Schmachtel mm -hmm. and Marina May. It's just that I think they're spread really thin, so ev and they're flying a lot. So every other email I send them is like an away notice. Mm -hmm. So, but they 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 they. <laughs> <laughs> it's like reimburse my tickets, please. Like a wait notice. Like, <laughs> like, I'm, oh sorry, <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> um, and then like, oh, I have these stock, and like, I keep them up to date about what's happening. Mm -hmm. It's just that maybe, uh, what was advised to me by that left was like maybe you should work with someone lower in the ranks. <laughs> Like, uh, because they they are the ones who are staying in the office and maybe have their feet on the ground. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Okay, on that note, yes. on that note about <laughs> the bureaucracy, <laughs> <go to Institute, laughs> I think maybe we can ask Regina to um, also fill us in a little bit about the general history of the Goethe Institute. What are its mandates, but also what are the self-understanding or self-understandings that it might have or some of the people working there might have, and especially, you know, thinking uh, in relation to Germany and the quote-unquote third world, right? The sort of cultural negotiations uh, that was going it's on. Uh, it's very interesting to find out uh, if he understands what I'm saying now about the Goethe Institute, <laughs> if my experience is the same, that because I worked for eight years in the, in the central office, and uh, my mission was to, to make cooperations in the media field, in radio and TV, about subjects in which happened abroad, in theater, in music, in visual arts, and so on. Uh, the Goethe Institute already existed before the Second World War. It was refounded uh, at the beginning of the 50s uh, with a symbolic act then uh, 52 in Athens was the first Goethe Institute abroad. Now they have, I think, 158 institutes all over the world. Uh, real Goethe Institutes, half Goethe <laughs> Institutes. Uh, it depends on the city and the region, uh, but they are connected all together. Um, it is an enormous body of people working there. I think around 3,500, 3, not counting all the local people in those institutes. The main issue always was and is uh, the to teach the German language. The it's like a kind of a hierarchy which developed. <laughs> I'm sorry, um, because when you are uh, when you are working with the language, you get in touch with the people. You get in touch with the local uh, conditions. You see what the people are doing there and what the artists are. So slowly it developed really in uh, two different departments. And this is also the, the same in the, in the main office in Munich. And uh, uh, let's say the, the ones who are taking care of the culture is, are the elite and the other ones are the workers. But they have to earn money. The Goethe Institute is uh, an fine, an association, a private association, but is completely financed by the Foreign Office, um, which means that they, they have certain tasks. And the Foreign Office is also paying the German schools abroad. There are a lot, I mean, even, I don't know, it must be the same amount like Goethe Institutes. And, um, as they are receiving, they are independent. I always said it's like arm length from the from the government, but they have to follow the main issues the the government is uh, planning. And uh, for until I came, let's say like this, in '93, there was a great independency of the local directors. The local directors took also always they were uh, responsible for the language work but they were also were also re responsible for the cultural work, work. and um, but they could do what they found locally they could emphasize they had money to do that we in the in the main office we had uh, we could give money project money and give advice more or less but uh, this kind of independency is 
slowly more and more reduced. The Goethe Institute divided the whole world into regions. For example, you have an important institute in Brussels, but it, it's connected, uh, it's the head of the Goethe in London. And Brussels is a completely different thing, you know, it's uh, European uh, policies, and London is, I mean, one of the cultural capitals in the world. So, uh, and a lot of other institutes are. And the, the guy or the woman who is sitting there in Brussels, he has to take care of all. And they are, they get money, they are not budgeted, what heißt this? They don't have a, the region doesn't have a fixed budget, but uh, they have to develop plans, which then gives them the possibility to, to work on that. But they, are, they cannot say, uh, I have such a good idea, which was in my time, happened. It's, I have a the very good idea, I would like to have 100,000 euros more. This is not easy. So, the, and on the other side, um, the Goethe Institute is, uh, has to follow this policy of the Foreign Office to have a German year in. So they have a German year in USA. They have a German year in Russia. It just finished <laughs> before the war with Ukraine. <laughs> Uh, then they are gathering a lot of ideas, and this is always connected also with the with the uh, economies. So Volkswagen is helping, or Siemens is helping, and so uh, this is, I would say, nowadays much more complicated to do work which is really connected to the place they are working with which means to work with the, with the artists. But this is like it's, it's always, I mean, wherever you look in Europe or in the world, it's the same development you have. Uh, Goethe is different in its organization, like the British Council or the Institut Francais. Those are much nearer to the government than the Goethe Institute is. <laughs> And uh, uh, there is a few collaboration works, cooperation works, but not so much. It's still, uh, it could be more. It started to be developed, for example, in such a big country like Luxembourg, <laughs> where you had a British council and a French institute and a good institute. Uh, it's, uh, but it, it happens, they have uh, some projects. I just had a look again at the website. But it's, uh, it, there's not a European, a real European issue. It's more, still more a, a national issue. But now, uh, this is the, the, uh, the situation now. You would agree? Uh, yes. Yeah. More or less? Still, still, still <laughs> the same. <Yeah. laughs> Um, but when this whole video and uh, work started, it was also here in Germany. For example, I mean, I'm coming from, uh, I, I made a lot of documentaries for TV. This was my first job before I came to the Goethe Institute and then I changed the job to be a producer. And, uh, but when I moved in, in uh, 85 from Hamburg to Bonn and there, <coughs> there was uh, an initiative for Videonale, which is, you know Videonale? Bonn. Yeah, and uh, they were in Oberhausen had an experimental part, it, because it's a short film festival, but the other bigger festival was in Osnabrück and uh, there we were, quite lonely. I mean, <laughs> we had not, no connections to, to Berlin and to Arsenal and things like that. Was th this was very far away. But uh, it was an immense movement towards video. What is video? And I mean, in those times, it was really handmade. You couldn't make any more advanced, I mean, even a, a, an a überblendung was a problem to do that, but any, anyway, 
we have a lot of uh, some, or not a lot of, but we have some uh, artists like uh, Marcel Odenbach and Ulrike Rosenbach, who still who started then and st are still doing the the same work. So um, th this movement also because there was a lot of press for it and it got some publicity and so on, it also came to the Goethe Institute. Mm -hmm. And uh, as normally main, the, the Goethe directors, they want to be, they are the best, the first, the ones <laughs> also to invite, to implement, to, and uh, this, they are really motivated, this was my experience in those times, the absolutely motivated personalities. So they looked also to moving images, not only the film, the big film department, but what was growing there, grassrooted also in Germany. Okay. Merv, maybe you can speak a bit about, because um, you've done interviews with uh, some of these artists and some of the workshop facilitators. Can you somehow reconstruct the sort of encounters? Because, of course, it's a very loaded context, and we know that there is power asymmetry there, you know, in terms of access to technology, access to funding, and all of this. But then you also said that you don't want to kind of um, stamp it and say this is, you know, cultural colonialism or cultural imperialism, right? So there, there are a lot of other things going on at more granular levels. And do you want to speak to that a little bit? Um, okay. A, oh, so one of the main people that I was, uh, that shared a lot of the archives and thankfully he shared some of these, the materials before him there was a fire in his house, mm. <laughs> uh, Christoph Janetsko. So um, it, for him, he was really, he loved Asia and he, he lived in Bangkok and Manila for until 2000. Mm -hmm. So in the Goethe Institute archives and also in Oberhausen and Arsenal and Osnabrück, mm -hmm. you could see sometimes uh, when he was signing off in contracts, the location would be in Bangkok, Manila. So, and he, he, he actually was very aware of the co-influence. So he was bringing something on the table, like maybe technical expertise, how to use um, like optical printing techniques. Uh, because he's, he was primarily a technician, no? Like, uh, and that's something that he continues to do until now. He works at, as a director of photography, DOP, but while still also making experimental films until now. Um, but he was also aware that you know that his his ideas and uh, of making work and his concepts and his influence was directly influenced by the people he was encountering in the global south, so, and um, he continued to work with them. So he, at least for him, that was very apparent, and um, to the point that when the Goethe Institute in the '90s said like, "Oh, we," because they were doing these touring programs, no? mm. kind of establishing a German canon. <laughs> like, uh, and a lot of that was actually because of Osn Osnabrück, I later found out. A lot of the personalities were people who were hanging out in, or teaching or be, were students in Osnabrück. In Gopetschke, um, like even Ulrich Gregor. Um, who, who is this? Do you remember? Who's the current director of ZKM? Weird Peter Weibel. So I saw them like, you know, like get drunken, <laughs> drunken party pictures of them in, in the early days of uh, uh, EMAF, especially during the days when they were not known as that. They were ca called the Experimental wor Film Workshop uh, Osnabrück. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So not yet the EMAF. Yeah, but I mean, it was a, uh, this was the start of everything, and it was not clear if it's video art or an experimental film. It uh, developed later into different uh, uh, direction. I mean, it, this was very clear. This is then an experimental film. It is based on film. Mm -hmm. This was a big discussion in the Goethe Institute. You cannot imagine how we fought that it's still uh, yeah. a discussion. A film has, uh, I mean, in the big cinema, cinema films shouldn't be uh, on a DVD or something like that, but should be 35 millimeter film. 
and the video people who were who could do uh, only very poor technical tricks in it they were the poor ones <laughs> but it's ironic because actually those people are more have a uh, larger circulation because these people crossed over to the contemporary art network much sooner. Mm. Um, and it, for me, it was really interesting to see these negotiations of format, negotiations of form, like uh, experimental film as film in 16, and then video art and pneumatic and beta or VHS. Mm. And at the same time that ne ne like negotiations of nation states and national identities and their own art histories were being negotiated concurrently. Mm. Well, well m new media, re at that time, I'm speaking about the 70s until the 90s, right? These new media were being introduced and their own histories were also being formed concurrently to the time when the Germans were also trying to figure out what, th what, what these definitions were in their context. Mm -hmm. And so I found that like, um, especially looking at these archives, like, because you, you, you think that they're quite formed right now, but it was, until now, it's still malleable. Mm -hmm. yeah, but another ex as aspect in those times also was, like it is from time to time till now, women artists and male artists in, in video mm -hmm. art, which is, uh, for example, uh, when you talk to Ulrike Rosenbach, she was uh, uh, engaged with Marcel Bruch, <laughs> and uh, he had a much better had a career than she ever could have, and she she had really feminist uh, contents. Uh, this was a really big discussion that came out then, but for example, Rotraud Pape, who was a very strong woman, she didn't care. <laughs> try to bring maybe another aspect or do you want to no, no, no. no. um, I guess the, uh, the, the, the sort of um, the elephant the invisible <laughs> elephant in the room is documenta because we're here and we're also doing this as documenta Institute why are we interested in that right um, and so basically given the fact that Goethe Institute was so connected and and was so active doing all these workshops and had essentially created a network of, um, of, uh, of, of video artists, right, filmmakers. Um, why did none of that somehow fed back into Germany? Um, we're looking at, you know, the 80s when it was already happening in many countries as Murph just listed, and then, you know, we don't hear anything about it until 93 in Oberhausen, that was the first moment, right? And it would take some of these artists uh, still an, an, a, f a few more years to a decade or yeah to make it to documenta, for example, such as Rax Media Collective. So I guess that the lapse of time is interesting. And does that actually mean that there's some kind of lapse in general um, between what the Goethe Institute does in those decentralized locations as outposts, and that has a certain logic of itself, right, of, uh, in terms of cultural diplomacy, but there's no feedback to sort of the cultural landscape of Germany. Maybe that's something that, Regina, you can speak about <laughs> in, in terms of institution. Uh, uh, it was a, a long discussion. I mean, uh, Good Institute always said we are doing a cultural dialogue, but the cultural dialogue did not happen in Germany, it happened abroad. <laughs> And uh, there were strong personalities like Wolf Herzogenrath, who, who made a big package of uh, video art. And he was invited from the Goethe Institute. Later, he created this video sculpture uh, definition. And he was sent around the world. Oder, uh, or uh, Fischli. Bodo Fischli. Bodo Fischli. Uh, he made a package and he sent it abroad. And uh, when I came in, in 93, they just had moved in a new house, uh, a double house. Uh, and for the first time, they were, after long discussions, they wanted to show what happened in the other countries. They were active. 
and they had a big, uh, uh, how do we call it, an, uh, ex a, a room, an, a, a theater, a big theater. Uh, it was dedicated that to a certain kind of programs coming in from outside to Munich. And uh, it, it had a, um, not a very good start because the first guy, who, a German, who, who took the job, he said, I'm the intendant of the Goethe Institute. <laughs> but he didn't, know, he didn't know the structure of the Goethe Institute, so he failed. And uh, this, um, this theater room for, let's say, 200 people uh, was not very often used. They used it more for their own festivitations. <laughs> um, this discussion is, uh, I think it's still going on. But in a certain moment, uh, I think the Haus der Kultur der Welt, whose first director was a Goethe director, Mr. Koenen, and whose first visual art uh, person was Wolfgang Pöllmann, also a Goethe people. So they, they took over and uh, they had a lot of money. It's always a lot of money and it has to do with the technical, a lot of things have to do with te technical development. So the Haus der Kultur in der Welt was such a big and wonderful venue, or is still. This, then they started a cooperation, which was clear. It was wonderful, but like things develop, he got more and more independent. Mr. Koenen started to think in his own way. And uh, there are the Goethe directors abroad, they wanted to, a lot of them wanted to cooperate, but it did not develop to a real movement. The connection was loose. And uh, this is a pity, so um, when, danke schön, when, um, now, as time changed so much, let's say since 89, it's a very, for us, it's a very uh, important, also in cultural policies abroad, it's a very important uh, uh, moment because in this uh, moment, there was no enemy anymore. The DDR had their, their own cultural institutes in the world, so suddenly it was, uh, it was gone. And then came the whole uh, development up to the, the the 2000s, and this is. I don't think that the Goethe Institute feels itself important in this dialogue from outside to inside, but it for exa it takes makes corporations, for example, with Documenta since many years, many times. Uh, but this is not much money. So they give a little money for the institutes abroad to help to develop like they did now. Uh, but they are present here, the logo is everywhere, but the Goethe Institute itself is not present, doesn't make any uh, programs. This is very, very important when you see how the world is globalized, then it's, uh, it's a gap in between. I mean, it's not, uh, I'm not the Goethe Institute director, so I'm sorry when I call to talk like this, but it's like it is now. I mean, I guess we all know, I mean, you and uh, Mervyn and me, we, we, we certainly know as um, people living in non-West countries, or I used to live in a non-West country, there's, there's all these strategies and tactics um, surrounding all these different cultural institutions, right? So you talk to the Goethe in one way and you talk to the French <laughs> in another way and you talk to the, I mean, in China, you don't talk to the Japan Foundation because the Japan Foundation doesn't support anything in China, but the Japan Foundation supports a lot of things in Southeast Asia. So there are a lot of that kind of like a, like a, like a gut feeling around um, this kind of cultural network um, of the Europeans plus Japanese uh, in, in, in those countries. Um, but then seeing it from the inside is kind of different, right? So the rationale, uh, as uh, Regina uh, tries to uh, explain it, is, is really, uh, I think in a way, is not something that you would see from the other side. I don't know if you can maybe see if there's anything to relate to in that sense, like 
on the practical side of things? Uh, there, there's, a, there's a few questions that, well, uh, quite a lot actually, that I've been trying to answer or at least, I you know, be congest while, while I, I'm doing this research. And it also relates to how I'm also looking at the different cultural policy uh, incursions by other countries, like th the Japan Foundation, for example. It's very interesting that, um, j just, just to uh, take it back away <laughs> from, uh, from Germany for a bit, and let's look at, because you mentioned the Japan Foundation. So it turns out that um, Suharto, uh, Sukarno, in, 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 uh, during, during the Pacific War, World War II, in the, in, in, um, met, met, uh, met, met this uh, general um, in, in Surabaya. And uh, they had an agreement that when, he, when they left, that they would leave arms. And, um, and Sukarno hid him from, 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 the, from, from the Americans. And uh, because if he came back and he surrendered much earlier, he'd be, uh, you know, subject to trial. And uh, and it was especially worse for him because he was a member of a secret society called the Black Ocean Society, which was in existence since the late uh, 19, uh, late 1800s during the Meiji Restoration, and they were an uh, ultra nationalist right wing organization. Uh, with the very pan-Asianist worldview, pan-Asianism in the sense of like, let's let's uh, let's have an Asian uh, Renaissance under Japanese leadership. Um, this guy would later be back in uh, Japan, and he would become the mayor of Fukuoka. And Fukuoka, under his term, uh, launched the first Asian-facing museum. So, and it was. Uh, succeeded by his uh, two, two or three mayors who were also had links to the secret organization. Not so secret anymore. Um, and, uh, and the Fukuoka Art Museum later split into the Fukuoka Art Museum and the Fukuoka Asian Art Museum had a huge impact into the dialogues of Asia and the dialogues of Asian and Southeast Asian contemporary art and how this followed a uh, kind of Meiji era uh, American Cold War uh, geopolitic construction. And for me, that, that's, that's a no, that's Japan Foundation. That's how, that's, that's, that's like, maybe, you know, maybe it's simplifying that, oh, J J Japan Foundation and Fukuoka Art Museums, I know, uh, ultra-nationalist right-wing agenda behind this uh, like cultural investment into Asia, particularly Southeast Asia. Um, of course, you know, that's simplifying it because among the curators, among the people in the establishment, they were aware of these histories also and they were challenging it consciously with their programming. So my question is, what was it like in the German context? What was the ideologies, what was the worrying ideologies that influenced cultural diplomacy from the German perspective? Because a lot of people were always saying that it was a way to, um, uh, perfume uh, Germans, uh, Germany's image in in the world. No, mm. like we have, we have reasons to take care of our image in the world. I think <laughs> uh, you must know that uh, the foreign the foreign office with the embassies. They have nearly all of them have. They are in the capitals of c countries but uh, where also good institutes are, but they have a cultural attaché. And they have different issues to take care of. And uh, since the beginning, as I said, this arm length uh, distance from the government, um, the good institute tried to, to be independent of, from that because the, um, an embassy consists of uh, not only a cultural uh, uh, attaché, but also uh, economic attaché and a lot of persons, maybe also secret p service persons, I don't know. But uh, the Goethe Institute is clearly only culture in a broader sense. I mean, language, 
and uh, artistic developments. And uh, in this way, the Goethe Institute tried to be independent. And I said, the, the ones who are working abroad, it's, it's hard to, to change all five years the country and maybe also the language you are working in then. But they are really very motivated. Let's say our system is uh, in small, to work in small pieces, many of them with not such a lot of money. Uh, you, like you can compare it a little bit the, with the federalism here in our country. We don't have a central government. We have uh, 16 differ different regions with different governments and so on. It's a, after the war and after the Nazi uh, disaster, it was the only way to get out. So uh, like, not like uh, the French or the British, they tried to be, to build up a more, more independent uh, moving uh, um, I mean, what a, a leichte, a leichte bewegung. Everybody can, so that everybody can move a little bit on its own. And it's not only dependent on what the state is telling or what the money is telling. You understand what I mean? Uh, this is, I have to add that uh, there's not much money uh, in the Goethe Institute, but uh, many interesting skills, for example, for, for the artists themselves, so they can, they get money to travel, which is very important. Uh, the Good Institute cannot follow then the projects which are developed or finance them, but uh, in a way, which is nice, they trust that you do it. <laughs> For example, uh, we should really talk also about the, uh, the impact of the uh, artistic developments here in Germany. And uh, Asia is far away from our point of view. You know, we are really European centralized Germany. Um, I think Africa is a little nearer. Um, so uh, our focus is not definitely not in the this many different and very big and potent countries which with different religions, for example. I mean, Indonesia as a Muslim state is a Muslim state. This is from the German point of view. You can follow, follow <laughs> this now in the Documenta discussion. It is, um, we are, we are in the middle of Europe. We are still in the middle of Europe. It, uh, and th it then, if something happened, and for the Philippines, I talked to a friend of mine who told me that this really was a very important development in the, in the media and, and video uh, time, uh, then it depends on, on the personalities of the director who's really emphasizing on that. I, I can you tell you a little story. Uh, when the ZKM in Karlsruhe opened, uh, we had just established the internet in the Goethe Institute. We had, a <laughs> <laughs> we had an intranet, which was nice, and I liked it very much to sit there at 10 uh, in the evening and talking to the people in San Francisco. Or, or, uh, so. Anyway, um, I organized a project uh, that the, uh, the, <laughs> the ZKM should open with the help of several good institutes all around the world, so that in 24 hours, it was always on air. Uh, and uh, there were fantastic people like uh, in, in Boston, the guy, or also in, uh, in Asia, seven, several institutes who worked with it. But this internet was not stable. They had invested a lot of developing what it was the first time that the, the network of the Goethe Institute would be visible on internet <laughs> in the world. <laughs> mm. 
And so they had very interesting and wonderful projects with a lot of fant fantastic uh, things. But this artist, but uh, the internet was not stable. It was a huge installation in the ZKM on the first floor. And uh, suddenly it fell down. There was only one region visible, and the others were far away. <laughs> they didn't come, and so you cannot imagine what a, what a disaster this was for me personally, because I was responsible for it. The Goethe Institute doesn't want to be experimental. It, it, not when it is on such a high level of communication. <laughs> when it's abroad, it could be. But anyway, there will be, uh, they are making the, the communication in between the Goethe Institute is very fast. So it was for me, it was a real disaster. And I said, when it happened, I said, but why are you uh, uh, complaining? I don't understand. You had your local system, you worked with the, the, the artists, you were on air on your own system. <laughs> but anyway, so um, this was the time when, uh, when the new developments came suddenly on also on Goethe, the, the whole digital problem. But Peter Weibel, he was really very uh, happy with me. <laughs> um, so I think we should open up to the audience for questions and comments maybe. Uh, but, 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 but thanks uh, Regina for, for sh uh, sharing um, sharing with us this personal dramatic episode so that we have a sort of image yeah we have a very very intimate image of this this blacked out computers or something as an image of the 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 non experimentality <laughs> of good <Goethe laughs> institute as, uh, yeah I, I, at least the good institute in, in in germany right i um, i love the good institute it's not a question of being critical. I mean, it's the development of times. Mm. And when you are in such a system, mm. you have to take care of yourself, but also for the others. Mm. This is like a festival, like doing a festival. <laughs> Goethe Institute as a festival. Okay. That's hmm? a good thing. Goethe Institute as a festival. <laughs> Um, any questions or comments from the audience? Hi, yeah, thank you, for all, uh, you both for, for this conversation and the presentation. Um, yeah, Murph, <laughs> lots of stuff that, we, that you alre we already talked before at some different moments. Um, first, uh, maybe a little observation, maybe you can expand on that um, um, as a reaction to, to what you were just speaking about, because. Uh, one of the foundations I know more closely is, uh, of course, the Pro Helvetia, um Foundation in Switzerland, which has at its first mission the um, the pr uh, promotion of the, the sw of the image of Switzerland abroad. Um, but nevertheless, they choose a structure where the contact to other countries is primarily through sending Swiss artists and. More so also in the visual arts department. Um, there are some regional uh, also differences. Um, there's the there's Swiss Institute in New Delhi, which is very interesting. Uh, the Swiss Institute in New York, which is also doing a very detached work from the rest of the network. Um, and now also the youngest uh, member, uh, the, 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 the South American network, which is also quite interesting. Uh, but I think that that's a bit an interesting difference. Um, of how to actually promote image and how to work um, with the world compared now to the Goethe Institute. Um, now my actual question uh, goes again also to both. Um, it's maybe a bit more of an understanding question because uh, about the workshops. So I do understand them as very technical or I understand this word uh, spaces for a technical encounters or an exchange on a more technical or content-based uh, matter. Oh. But I was wondering what was the positioning of the workshops within the 
good uh, uh, um, activities, what was the projected or the hoped outcome for it, what was also the perceived um, experience um, in the local cultural landscape. Um, was this something like a light fire where everybody would orient them for, uh, at or was it something more niche for a very specific small group that afterwards was nurtured and then came up to be a, a, a defining uh, group of artists? Um, I think it really depended on the different uh, directors and the different artists. Um, I gave examples mostly from the Philippines, but I could trace more of these uh, workshops and collaborations much earlier on in the context of Latin America, for example. And I think that had a lot to do with the fact that Latin America had a large U German and European diaspora. And some of the biggest names, or more well-known names in artist moving image in Buenos Aires, for example, were those that were identified with the so-called El Grupo Gete, that were as active during the dictatorship period. They were working a lot with Werner Nikes. And Werner Nikes was a close personal friend of Ingo Pechke, and Ingo Pechke created the first, you know, <laughs> one of the first experimental touring workshops. So these, these histories are like uh, convoluted and like, um, yeah, quite, quite intimate in that way. Um, but yes, it, it really depended on the different directors and the different artists, and they had different modes of engagement. Sometimes, like for example, in Hong Kong, the, it was a different model. A lot of the artists uh, have an established like, practice already. Um, so it was more about like trying something else. It was more about a collaboration, a dialogue, and uh, experimenting together. And uh, in expanding the field in the context of, for example, uh, Hong Kong Baptist University. Um, working with the students. Whereas, for example, in Bangladesh, a lot of people wouldn't have access to some of the equipment, or they will be a bit more, um, like, like, technical equipment was a bit more sparse, only like schools or the film studios or television studios would have them, but then you'd want to expand the field to include more artists who were dabbling into uh, like moving image and that and those workshops had a direct relationship to, I guess, the 80s, 90s wave of uh, Bangladesh uh, independent moving image, uh, particularly that that uh, that generation of ex uh, documentary filmmakers. Um, and in the Philippines, of course, a lot of experimental film. It was very technical, also. Um, but uh, f it, it, it again, it varies per context. In the Philippines, I think it created a cycle of this dependency because um, there was this resistance, f like, oh, we're creating a new vocabulary, we're creating a new aesthetic, sure, but with German funding. <laughs> but there was nothing else after that. There was no support from the local infrastructure. So when, when, af like when the, the directors changed and the funding dried out, there was, a, there was a quite a lull, and it was a palpable lull. Like you'd, you'd see the, there was less short film, experimental film being sent out into international festivals because there was a lack of production, because there was no more support. And it was only really like, you know, more, more independent productions, like, uh, like more like uh, coming out more in artist run spaces, for example, that would later find itself in circulation, but not, not no longer in like the film festivals, but much later on. So there was really uh, quite a lull, but not so much in Hong Kong because Hong Kong had a more sustained uh, like, uh, infrastructure. The artists uh, were a bit more savvy. They were more conscious about developing an infrastructure to, to sustain this kind of momentum. And the artists were also conscious of institution building. So Phoenix Cine Club, for example, who were concentrating in Super 8 from the 
like 70s, 80s, were uh, transitioned into videotage, which is still in existence today, and where and they continue to have an archive of both the Super 8 stuff that they were that they, they had origins from, and also uh, the video works that they were, they continue to be producing, and uh, and. And foot, uh, Gut Institute there is like one of the many important footnotes because like it, they were important in creating, for example, the first international video art uh, exhibition and with Barbara Haman doing a workshop. But it was, it was, it, they built on that. They didn't become dependent on it. So did, did that answer your question? <laughs> You, you mentioned Hong Kong. I was there for this uh, video <laughs> art exhibition. <laughs> 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 uh, but uh, we were in this workshop. I w we had another workshop also for uh, TV corporations. And uh, we were transported to Shenzhen. Mm. And then in Shenzhen, uh, they showed us the planning of the museums. There's an area in Shenzhen where they, they planned and built different museums. And it was on a hill, and we were standing on a hill and looking. Uh, there was a big uh, um, of concrete or something. It was like all the, the, the buildings. And the, the people who came with us from Hong Kong, they looked at it and they said, oh, how wonderful here it is in in the Chinese Republic, <laughs> they are planning such wonderful uh, organizations, and we in Hong Kong, we have nothing. And it was like this in, in, in the, those times. There were no plannings for the big museum, which is now there, and so on. It is, it is uh, when you are looking back, it is a, s a special, it was really a, a special situation. And uh, the, the funding in Hong Kong was very poor. I don't know if they even had a funding. But I wanted to say like like uh, those enormous cities like Bangkok or Manila or Jakarta or uh, whatsoever. I mean, you you have to be informed that there is a Goethe Institute, that there is a possibility to take part in a workshop. I mean, there are 10, 20, 15 million people, and I don't know how many artists and how many of them really get in contact which is really something. And then you have, a, you have a system that after five years, this fantastic Mr. Schmelter had to leave. And the next one says, video art, not with me. <laughs> I'm looking at literature or translations and something like that. I mean, this is a, a very French, uh, fragile system. Uh, to, to build up continuities is not so the thing in a, in a world like uh, also for embassies. But I personally worked a lot with, um, with Buenos Aires and Santiago de Chile because there is a huge European people and understanding, not funding, but understanding. And uh, it was much easier to, to create uh, corporations than it was, for example, in Africa. I mean. I sent, uh, I helped uh, Marcel Odenbach to go to West Africa. And I finan financed his uh, video on Rwanda, the Rwanda conflict. And uh, Marcel got so involved in the local things that he, with his uh, husband, he built a house there and he's, li he's living partly there. Mm -hmm. So this real connections are very seldom. But I would like to ask you the question, what do you think was the impact here? What is your, did you have any experiences that the influence from the Philippines manifested in any uh, work of uh, media artists or Asian uh, developments? Maybe not. not, not through the Goethe Institute though. Yeah. It was really more an artist artist affair. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But then you can say, I mean, the positive thing is that this artist-artist relation was supported or is supported by the Goethe Institute. I think, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, not everywhere, not to every time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so 
But yeah, I think maybe the most well-known example of uh, was it was Kidlat Tahimik when he won 1977 at the Arsenal uh, with his first feature film. And um, in his honor, one of the squats in Berlin was named after him. Uh, I mean, named after the film. Mm -hmm. uh, what, the, what, how do you translate the perfume not nightmare? Uh, there are, uh, um, anyway. But yeah, th there was supposed to be a squat called the Perfume Nightmare at some point in Berlin. Hi, um, thank you. Sorry, I have, I'm gonna just speak since I have the mic. Um, thank you so much for um, sharing this. A couple of notes on, uh, I'm from Hong Kong, uh, and I've, uh, because of a past life, done a little bit of research around um, Hong Kong's art history, but not so much in um, video. But Videotage um, was the Phoenix uh, Zine Club's women who became Videotage, and sort of a uh, Videotage as a fundamentally queer space, um, especially for um, lesbian women, are sort of beginning to be sort of studied and sort of more visible at this moment. Um, and the question of funding, um, Hong Kong's uh, funding in visual arts took a big sort of pivot in 1995. And I think that was before the, that was actually after the Goethe workshops, which was, I guess, in the earlier 90s. So what you describe, I, I would sort of imagine is not sort of, it's probably the situation. And the Baptist U Film School focused a lot on TV production, which was quite naturally then they were excited about the TV sets that were being built across the Shenzhen River, as a lot of the TV production were made across the border and it increasingly became so in the 90s. Um, but I do have a question for um, Merv, because I was actually struck by what, um, Regina, you were describing how the Goethe Institute imagined the world in regions, or it sort of um, governed or sort of operated through the regions. But the ground reality was very national, nationally driven. It was driven by the nation, um, or the, the, the nation that the people that were sent into. And I was can't help but sort of think that how that sort of is reflected in what happens now in Southeast Asia as a region, where then the region itself tries to then write this history of itself as a region and done through Singapore, because that's where the money and the power is. So my question is then, where do you see your own research fit then, Merv, in terms of then looking for these really interesting sort of national, not national, or just sort of nationally sort of configured activities supported by Europe, but sort of being such sort of situated in this sort of larger narrative of a regional history writing. And maybe, maybe media art or experimental video has a, has a place in it, right? Actually, I have to say I sold Murph's soul to Singapore. <laughs> There's a lot of interest from Singapore, actually, in terms of that research and, and in a way, you know, expropriating that from, you know, the European network or the European late network into a more regionally owned network, once again, via Singapore. The yeah. Yeah. Singapore actually hosted a screening, right, of some of these um, films a while ago at the National Gallery? Um, they, at the National Gallery, yes, Lisa Chikyamko. So Lisa Chikyamko is one of the uh, curators, a Filipino curator working a lot with the moving image research, particularly artists' moving image and its connections to conceptual art and photography and performance in, since the late 60s. But anyway. Um, so not directly just Goethe Institute stuff. For me, the Goethe Institute research is a way to uh, leave region behind, leave the nation behind. Because um, I, I consider my practice to be a continuation of my interest in institutional critique. Um, <laughs> but not, not so much and like what Marcel Broderas was doing, for example. I, I don't want to make these these spectacles or non-spectacles, I want to actually uh, contribute to art history, to film history, to media art history, because this this is what our these these this is these archives are what's lacking in 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 my context, and um, 
And I think nation states and are as fickle as media states. There's always transitions. So any nation is a state of negotiations. Such uh, any like any film format or media m moving image format, there will always be a new, better format. It's always a state of negotiations, and it's not just capitalist-driven. Um, and for me, uh, I've, I've been looking at these as uh, the Goethe Institute as an entry point to more a nuance, uh, parallel comparisons into the different histories of individuals and uh, ecologies of practice across the world. So not necessarily nation states, I, uh, not necessarily um, cities, but groups of artists that are not bound to, geopol uh, to geopolitical configurations of location. Because there is, for example, I really want to pursue this um, this this history of of uh, collaboration between Club Automatique and House of Natural Fiber. You wouldn't normally associate those two, for example, like um, and uh, or or even the just the the Anetsko research, which is not restricted to just Southeast Asia or Asia, but also looked at Glasgow or Latin America. So even within the artists, there's a lot of nuances and like how they were able to sustain those relationships or not sustain those relationships or how those experiences influence their practice is really quite interesting for me. And I don't think, um, I'm sh maybe it will contribute to a, a, a more traditional area studies model of art history, sure, but that's not the, you know, that's not the goal of the research. And uh, hopefully there's an other ways of looking into uh, the histories of practice and then, then you know, the, the national. Super quick footnote. I think that's actually what John Clark has been trying to do, right, in terms of defining or redefining the Asian modernities. Mm -hmm in a art historical sense. But yeah, so he's just, you know, he's tracing like, you know, the he's really basically tracing the the, 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 the mobilities of artists and, and groups uh, of uh, uh, of artists who share certain affinities. And sometimes even across time, right? And across national border. Anyway, that's a that's more art historical than, than it needs to be. <laughs> yeah, maybe just to double down on the like last question. Um, because so I understand in a way that the Goethe Institute becomes an epistemology to what you actually want to research, more like the access points through which you go through. Um, what are the limits of the Goethe Institute in that sense? Like, do you think there's like a, a point where you need to leave the Goethe Institute archive to actually uh, continue that search, or is this now the all-encompassing institution, so to speak? that has uh, shaped the, all these developments that you are following? There is no good institute archive. <laughs> 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 I went there. <laughs> she knows. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, also concerning the activities and the histories that you've been following, like the, the programming, etc. So I guess in, in I, I'm, I'm actually doing a lot of work for them in the sense that I'm making a catalog of their activities. I'm making a catalog of the works that they produced um, that they don't, e that you know, the main headquarters, or even the regional or the city headquarters don't have any knowledge of. And it's because it was the other guy that replaced it. It was, you know, it was another time and they, 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 they're much more preoccupied with the present. Um, which is ironic because they fund a lot of archiving projects, right? <laughs> <laughs> so not so much archiving themselves and uh, uh, make cons consolidating and accounting for their own histories, but well, you know, uh, other other people, other other institutions elsewhere. Um, but uh, the cutoff for me is really like uh, a cutoff of format. Um, I, I, I end in DVD. <laughs> when the, the solution gets shittier, yeah. Um, 
Uh, but um, otherwise, also, you, you, you go tend to go on forever, no? Uh, with the research. So th for, for me, it's until, say, the in the two early 2000s, before uh, the internet fully took over and ev there, there was a uh, YouTube. Um, but the, the, the earlier periods, and especially the, trans the transitionary periods, between formats is what's particularly interesting for me, especially also exp uh, exploring more non-male approaches because at, at least that's missing in a lot of these things. Um, a lot, it's great that a lot of artists like Rotrot Pape, Maria Vedder, uh, Monica Funke Stern were artists that also started in, in, in film in some way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Barbara Haman, before they, 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 they did the video, and, it, and uh, it, it was fantastic that they also found circulation in some of these um, workshop networks and co-productions, but um, uh, there's an elusivity of the material still. Uh, but because, of they were, because they were also strong women figures, they also influenced strong women artists in different er areas where they went. Like uh, Ayn Lal, who's quite an established figure in uh, Indian uh, mo uh, video art and dance film, uh, she 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 really credits Maria Vedder as one of the turn like you know a mentor figure that like really turned her her practice on edge and reconsidered like her role as an artist in in New Delhi at that time period and like you know so it was like, something that I'd want to explore further these like uh, women in career histories and video, because a lot of the time I've been confronted with a lot of talkative men, <laughs> like, <laughs> who are like very generous, but, <laughs> but, 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 but it's also because they were also in positions of power, no? Yeah, make, yeah. Um, but uh, I, there was this one interesting account of, uh, that I found from Detlef Gerike, that uh, the program officer at the, um, in the 80s and 90s in Jakarta, because I was asking like, why weren't there workshops in Jakarta during that time period? That uh, why did why were they sending artists all the way to Manila or or Thailand, for example, to participate? Why not just hold it there? And they said like because of so so hard though because of censorship. They were hard having a hard time, but they were doing these underground informal sessions. In, they called the, the kitchen sessions in this in this lady's house, and the uh, constellation of artists w was particularly interesting because you had Gotot Prakosa. They had a lot of these interesting artists from not just Jakarta but around Japanese arch like you know the Indonesian archipelago also who were passing through, who were part of these discussion groups, who were part of these screenings that were off the grid and totally illegal from a so hard to standpoint. Um, so, so still, I'd like to reiterate now that the Goethe Institute as an entry point, but really looking at the agents, at the characters that really created these histories, because I think she's much more interesting than the institution that she helped establish, right? <laughs> when I left, I had to leave because I had nothing to do anymore. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. They took away my budget. So I was lucky to to get to the uh, Arts Foundation Notre Westphalia and uh, it was a little uh, it w very sad. You are really working in the world and now then you are working in the German region. But I had such good friends somewhere in the Goethe Institutes that we could create wonderful projects together. So this is depends always on people. A very simple thing. Maybe, maybe we can sort of uh, run it up and say that it is really about the agents, right? So we didn't really come in to try, try to prove, you know, which cultural foundation or which national uh, foundation is more innocent than another. Although it's, you know, in, in, in some ways we could have actually done it, and then you know I can go on for another hour about Chinese cultural diplomacy. <laughs> um, 
But uh, but but I think we definitely need the awareness. And uh, actually, last week um, we hosted an event that's looking at the role of cultural foundations and, and cultural funding in general with practitioners, with the f uh, the the funders, and with researchers. So you do have a sense that th th there's a self understanding also from the founders' side that what they do is. Uh, has a lot of times repercussions, and you know sometimes you can actually shape a whole a whole artistic practice, right? You can sort of mold artists in a way that you want them to be, and of course it's not good, or or, or maybe what I mean it is probably it's too early to say if it's good or bad, but but we need a certain awareness of that, and so cultural foundations are now in the process of reflecting on that, which is good. And I think we need more dialogues like this, um, researches that go into um, these directions, but that really tries to, 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 to understand the, you know, the, 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 the influences and, and communications in multiple ways. Yeah. I, I would like to add something. We are living in a very happy country because we have a very good cultural uh, funding. We are really a good platform and uh, as you know me we created a small institution academy for the arts of the world in cologne so you can see that this idea of globalization or working together is not is uh, present in germany and is developing i was one of the founding members and it's very important to to know that Maybe we are not uh, so nice people <laughs> like f like the French or the Italians or I don't know, but we are welcoming you all. <laughs> okay, on that note, Anilas, you want to top it up? I think something. I think if I say something. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Murf and Regina. Thanks to everyone for coming. Thank you.